next speaker was eh, 12 years ago at a conference in Berlin that shall rename unnamed, where he presented an automotive car hacking talk before it was called car hacking, where he injected RDS traffic and could reroute your navigation system. Luckily, he's no longer breaking cars, but instead, uh, well, went on building secure stuff. And for one of this, the USB armory that you might have heard of, he has now come up with Tamago, a full bare metal Go runtime for your secure software development needs. Please give a warm round of applause to Andrea Barizani. Thank you. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, OK. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for reminding me how old am I. And, uh, and yeah, so we still break cars, but just, uh, just we, that's, that's work now and not fun anymore. And the fun stuff is actually this one. So, but we still, we still break cars, actually. So um, I work for F-Secure. Uh, just a little bit of introduction about myself. I work for F-Secure, and I, some of you might know me for a company which I founded, which was called Inverse Path, which was acquired uh, a couple of years ago by F-Secure. I'm, uh, I'm one of the author of the USB Armory. And yeah, as, as, uh, as it was mentioned in the introduction, I uh, work a lot with hardware and embedded systems on safety critical systems, such as uh, uh, airplanes, cars, industrial systems, and, and so forth. And, because I'm, I'm, I'm getting old, basically, uh, now I tend to uh, like to build things, to make things, rather than only uh, breaking them. I think this is an inevitable phase in the life of information security researchers. And because uh, you get old, you, you get a little bit tired of just pointing your finger at things that are broken. And, and at some point, the industry becomes so good at breaking things that uh, I think that we also should stop a little bit and, and think about uh, creating tools, hardware, and software which can really uh, serve the non-security community better into, into solving all kinds of security issues. Because we see that there are a lot of issues that they never change, despite the fact that we're almost in 2020. And one of the motivations for us into building open hardware, such as the USB Armory and, and Tamago, which is directly linked to the USB Armory, as you will see, it's also to provide better tools, tools that are maintained, that work, that are clean, that are trusted. And I think this is a phase that a lot of information security researchers at my age now are getting through, which, again, is just, I guess, getting old. So the USB Armor is an open hardware computer which is meant to, to be a secure enclave in a very, very small uh, form factor, just a USB uh, device. And, and Tamago is based on our need to uh, build software in a better way uh, for, for this device. So the whole inspiration comes for the, for, for the journey of creating, of creating this hardware. And, and, and it comes from, from, from a very simple uh, scenario that we face while uh, testing all kind of embedded systems. So I'm a strong believer of the fact that, uh, just like natural language, I mean, if any of you want to code for a specific device in whatever language you like and you prefer, you should be able to do it. And if that language, for some reason, its implementation uh, generates a compiler which is not fast enough for you to have a successful project on any piece of hardware, that is not necessarily your fault, or it shouldn't be your fault in choosing the wrong language. It shouldn't be any wrong language. The language should be adapted to your need, to your style. Um, it, 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 you, as a programmer, as a developer, we should, in an ideal world, care or not care at all about how the compiler is optimized or not. In an ideal world, all compilers uh, should generate uh, machine code with the same efficiency. You know, if you like to do math in SQL queries or in Go, Rust, Python, assembly, whatever, in an ideal world, in like a Star Trek USS Enterprise E world, it should all generate the same, the same bytecode because the intention that you're giving to the code remains the same. You want to do the same operation. However, we, don't, we do not live in an ideal world. We live in a real world, and this means that developers, to make the choices that they need to make in selecting framework and languages, they really need to be careful about the implementation that 
the language is reflecting, uh, the implementation that the language is supporting, that the hardware that is supporting, and this is not ideal. So usually there are very two distinct scenarios. We have hardware, we test hardware for a living that has lower specifications microcontroller units, which are used because um, uh, engineers want to simplify their design or they want to save money on the parts, whatever the reasons. And the only practical choice or the only real world choice for programming on these devices in, in, in a client production system is by using unsafe lower level languages, which is typically means min C. And so we tested in, in, in our work cryptography tokens, wallets, uh, hardware diodes that play a very important role into ensuring uh, separation of safety boundaries on things like cars and planes, and all your lower specifications, IoT and smart appliances, they all have firmware that despite, despite doing operations which are pretty basic, they're all written in a language which is unsafe from an implementation perspective. Um, on the other hand, if we have hardware with uh, higher level specifications, uh, we can code in pretty much anything we want, but, be, but we need the support of a complex operating system to do that. So if we have a system on chip and we can run Go, Python, whatever higher level language on it, we're just shifting complexity around. So the complexity and the, uh, let's say, unsafeness is taken away from us as a programmers, but it's distributed everywhere else in the stack that allows us to run that code because we're going to have uh, a Linux system, we're going to have a lot of drivers that maybe we don't want. We're going to carry on millions of lines of code that are not strictly necessary for the task that we're doing. And as we know, complexity is an enemy uh, of, of security. And if I want to program a system in a higher level language, I just don't want to put all of that complexity under a carpet and have it there running underneath me. I just want it to go away. As a security person, that's the reason why I pick a higher level language. So we face these two scenarios and none of them is ideal. And so uh, also in this case, now we see uh, a shift towards system on chips away from microcontrollers, also in avionics, in, in any kind of system which needs to be a little bit more complex, your home router, uh, higher specification IoT and smart appliances. And we also see, which is quite common, that despite having this power and the underlying OS, we still see C applications running in user space on this system. Your infotainment system is very likely uh, to do that, even if there's no uh, good reason for doing so. And we pop them all the time because uh, inevitably uh, C is a hard language to code with. We, we should realize that no matter if you're a C lover or not, it is now vastly proven that it's very difficult uh, to, to, to have production grade code uh, uh, done by you know, a lot of developers to be safe because it just takes too much toll on the effort for making it safe. So our uh, penetration testing rate on this kind of system is always 100%. And as we built a system on chip based hardware, we didn't want to, uh, to face these situations. We didn't want to write uh, bare metal code in C. And at the same time, we didn't want to have our uh, higher level language applications uh, running under complex operating systems. Um, and our goal in doing this is to reduce the attack surface of embedded system. We don't want to carry millions of lines of code that we feel are unnecessary. We want a system to perform only the bare minimum of what we need to do. And we think that this can be done by removing any dependency whatsoever on C code or uh, complex operating systems. So we want to avoid shifty complexity around or having complexity hidden from us. And we want, but we want to run a higher level language such as Go directly on the bare metal. And that is the motivation for Tamago, which is directly inspired by uh, creating the USB, USB armory in the first place. Now, of course, a lot of you, I mean, I would assume that some of you know Go here, uh, and a lot of people are thinking, why not Rust? And we're going to get to that. But the, 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 the point here that we're, gonna, we're trying to make with this project is why not both? We want people to have the choice of using the language that they want. And since, and since we, we want to use Go, that's why we created this, this framework. So why Go? 
Uh, so first of all, disclaimer, because I know uh, when we enter into this, uh, these topics, there's a lot of flame wars, people have feelings, I have feelings, you have feelings, everybody has feelings about languages and so forth. So this is not a talk about saying that language X is better than language Y. I'm not, I'm not here to say that Go is better than Rust. I'm here to say that we think that certain languages which have less of a chance now to succeed on bare metal applications, they can have this chance. So we want the ecosystem to be more diverse, and this is why we made this effort. But it's not to say or to force you or to tell you that Go is better than Rust. In fact, we want you to have the choice, and we want to give a choice of Go, which uh, wasn't present in the past. So if we look at speed versus safety axis, so to speak, also this is not to scale. If you know Rust, if you're in love in Rust, you might decide to place the R of Rust in a different location on the chart, and this is absolutely fine. Again, this is not to scale. Scale is objective here. But we all agree that if we would draw a line, Go is something which is, of course, lower than Rust in, in its uh, uh, end result. Uh, but it's easier to a certain extent to, to learn. The learning curve is certainly easier, uh, more shallow on Go than, than on Rust. Um, Rust, of course, is much better than C. It's, of course, it's a safe language. And if we go on the other side of the spectrum, we have C, which gives you uh, more control, more hardware control, but it's also hardware uh, to implement correctly. And now we are in a situation where languages like Go, which are fairly fast, and they are much faster than languages such as Python or Ruby, so they can be really be used to create binaries that run on embedded systems. However, they are a little bit detached from the hardware. So if you want to either run on the bare metal or make firmware that is low level, uh, they're not ideally suited for now. So we want to somewhat fix that, at least for, for the Go language. And one of the reasons why we want to do this is because this is the typical setup of a secure firmware that we make for either the USB armory or other kind of embedded systems. We have a bootloader. Uh, uh, which is secure booted by the hardware, by the system on chip. So we have the first stage authentication of the bootloader. And then typically the bootloader authenticates and loads a Linux kernel image because that's the operating system that most people use. And that's the operating system which at bootstrap the whole decryption procedure for, uh, let's say that you have an encrypted partition and so forth. And maybe it has drivers, it communicates with the system on chip to get some key material uniquely derived from uh, something stored only in that chip. So this is a typical chain of uh, secure and verified boot to achieve authentication of all of your code and also confidentiality of the data. And the problem is that we're typically faced with a scenario where we're developing something, let's say a cryptocurrency wallet or whatever crypto related firmware, and now we code it in a language like Go, and we have very few lines of code in Go, a few thousand lines of code. We use the standard uh, library of Go for everything, for TLS, for crypto, so we minimize the third-party dependencies, and we have a code which is clean and nice. However, in order to boot this image on something like the USB armory, we need to carry around uh, a Linux image to do fairly simple tasks, such as uh, decrypting something, uh, talking to the system on chip, doing USB, and then launching our Go application. So in the end, uh, to us, it's kind of unelegant, the fact that we spend so much time simplifying and cleaning up the code of the firmware, and then we need to carry a giant operating system compared to what we need to do. And we need to update it very often uh, because Despite the fact that you only have a few drivers exposed, you still want to keep it up to date because you never know. And of course, you also have user space tools, which I mean, you can try to reduce them as much as you can. You use BusyBox, you use a uh, framework for generating uh, compact Linux images such as BuildRoot and so forth. But still, it feels it doesn't feel the right thing uh, to do this could be more optimized. And while this is an example for the USB armor, it applies to pretty much all kind of embedded systems that we test and they have some sort of secure booting and so forth. They all follow uh, the same pattern we're using a system on chip. So what we really want to do is take Go and move it down there on the axis. So we want to keep the same ease of uh, and speed and efficiency in development, but we want to have more hardware control, which also means that we want to kind of remove this red box over there. We want to take away the millions of lines of code that we don't own, that we don't maintain, that we're kind of stuck with. So this is the idea of, uh, of Tamago. 
So, of course, this is not a new concept. Uh, uh, this is known as unikernels or library operating system, which are single address images uh, which typically run under the bare metal. And their focus is to reduce the attack surface. The problem, however, with available unikernels is there are most of them, not all of them, uh, they are so-called fat uh, unikernels because so, first of all, a good chunk of them is just, again, hiding complexity for you. So, there's a good portion of unikernel projects that they give you an, an API and documentation and they tell you, look, you're going to develop your application, you're going to compile it, and then that's going to be executed. But in the end, they do have an actual kernel underneath, which sometimes it's even derived from fairly complex uh, operating systems such as NetBSD and FreeBSD. And the whole framework just uh, puts you, uh, it puts a lot of abstra abstraction layers in the middle so that you don't see the kernel, you don't see the runtime, and you just deploy your application. Now, uh, this is all well and good, but from a security standpoint, this doesn't really solve the problem. In fact, I think it creates the opposite problem. So while researching for this talk, uh, I kind of looked at all the unikernel projects that are around, and for most of them, it was really hard to find which kernel they were running. And the documentation kind of gives you the illusion that there are this magical bare metal project, but they're actually not. A lot of them, they just pull in code from NetBSD or FreeBSD. Most of them, they are based on third-party uh, kernels such as uh, MiniOS, which is granted it's 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 uh, it's uh, uh, written in C still, but uh, uh, much. Uh, shorter and smaller code base that's something like FreeBSD. And also, most of them, they are actually not focused on the bare metal in the sense that they're not focused on running on embedded systems, but they're focused on running on the cloud. And so they all support hypervisor, such as uh, Zen, which is not what we want to do on embedded system. So for uh, all of these reasons, the existing, most of the existing unicorn projects, they're not really suited for uh, embedded system developments, and they don't achieve what we want to achieve, which is kill C. I don't want any dependency on C written code whatsoever while uh, having my firmware running. And if I'm going to have a hypervisor or if I'm going to have a kernel written in C, you know, you can abstract that as much as you want, you can hide it, but it's really not going to solve the need that I have. So um, this is really not what we wanted. The other problem is that uh, there's a, when it comes to security, um, these unikernel projects, and rightly so, they want to support arbitrary applications. So they want you to be able to compile your application in whatever language you want, uh, and then to execute it. Uh, or they also want to be able to be kind of OSs and then provide support for multiple applications. But the thing is, if you're having multiple applications and different trust domains under a unikernel, or if you're running an application which is written in an unsafe language, like in C, you kind of want an industry standard OS because you kind of want uh, address space uh, layer randomization. You do want uh, stack canaries. You, you do want all of the security features that are the good parts of complex operating systems and that are there for you. So we think in our approach that unikernels such as this one, so or at least we are interested only in unikernels that allows us to run bare metal on embedded systems, and we want to run a single higher level language on that unikernel. We're not interested in everything else, because for everything else, we think that actually maybe operating systems are a little bit better. Uh, so we don't want to focus on the cloud. We don't want to rely on an hypervisor. And, and again, I explain why we choose Go. It's what we use a lot, and so we wanted to give Go a chance because we think it has a, a shallow learning curve. So productivity uh, can be very good with Go, and it also, primarily, it has a very strong cryptographic library that uh, we want to use. And again, Rust has already proven that it has a role in the bare metal world. So we, it has nothing to prove, and it's going to succeed as well. But Go doesn't have the chance, and that's what we want to give to go, this chance, because we think it really can, and we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna see why. So in a nutshell, what we're going to try to achieve, because the other message of this talk is that it's important how you do it, not, not only what you do, because anybody can run Go. Uh, anybody can, can understand that with the right effort, you can put Go on the bare metal. It's fine. But the problem is, how do you achieve that? Uh, because there's, a, there's, a, there's an element of trust there. So, and we're going to get to that. So, Tamago is 
the idea is that we want to find the path of least resistance in patching the Go compiler. We want a patch which is absolutely minimal to cleanly enable support on the bare metal. So our take is to provide a different OS variable to, uh, to Go. So normally in Go, you have Go OS to specify whether you're under Windows, Linux, or other operating systems. So we created a separate Go OS support uh, and a minimal patch to enable that on the ARM architecture so that we can run the runtime on bare metal. So this is one part of uh, Tamago. The second half is a set of packages that provide support for hardware boards, so uh, the driver, so to speak. So right now, we have support for uh, the USB Armory system on chip, which is actually a widely used system on chip, so it's not just specific to the USB Armory, which is uh, a member of the NXP IMX6 uh, family, and we're going to target more, uh, more platforms in the future. And our goal for doing this is, again, to develop uh, security applications uh, using uh, the existing open source tooling that we have for signing secure boot images and so forth for, for the USB Armory. So there have been similar Go efforts in the past, and there are similar Go efforts right now. Uh, but for a variety of reasons, they all didn't quite fit what we needed to do. So we had two projects, uh, mainly, which are now uh, maintained. There was a project called Biscuit, which uh, wanted to actually create a kernel uh, OS kernel in Go. So the idea there wasn't just to support Go application, or but to support any application written in any language uh, with POSIX compliant interfaces and so forth. Um, this is a maintain. Uh, there's a lot of complexity to, to the project because they do memory allocation and threading and so forth, and they adjust the uh, existing Go OS Linux support despite not running Linux. So for these reasons, it wasn't exactly what we were looking for. There was a, there's another project, uh, a maintain, which is called GERT, which is an ARM adaptation of Biscuit for running actually only Go applications. Uh, again, it adjusts Go OS Linux and has more complexity to it than what we want. So that's also uh, something that is not suited for what we wanted. There's another nice project called Atman OS, uh, which was presented, I think, uh, three years ago, which is kind of similar to Tamago. However, it targets the Zen hypervisor uh, and has limited runtime support, which is also something that we don't want. Now, of course, if you if you like Go, if you know a little bit about, about the ecosystem, you, of course, might know about TinyGo, which is active and rocking. It's a, it's a great project. However, for our purpose, TinyGo is not, is not quite what we wanted because it's a complete different re-implementation of the, of, the, uh, of the Go compiler. So it's a different compiler, not the original one. And because it targets microcontrollers and not system on chips, uh, it provides a different runtime with a more limited language support. So it's not quite having like vanilla, uh, vanilla Go. So it has a different, a different focus. Uh, and then a brand new, which was actually published a, a few days ago, we have Embedded Go, which is a kind of a new project which uh, targets also microcontrollers and the FUM uh, architecture. So it has actually adds new uh, compiler support for it uh, because uh, uh, ARMv7M is not native to Go. Uh, so it adds uh, a no OS uh, Go OS for the FUM architecture. Uh, so again, it does something a little bit different than what we do, but it's actually a quite interesting project. So we're gonna uh, keep a close eye uh, on that. So all of these projects, despite whether they are maintained or not, or whether uh, they, they are complex or not, uh, and they do what we like or not, they really helped us in proving that this can happen. So throughout our project, we, our, our, our approach to it is not that we needed to understand if this was possible. We just needed to understand if this was possible without polluting the compiler, if it was possible to do cleanly enough. And all of these projects just gave the assurance that this can be done. So we're really grateful to all of the people that put their effort into, into these projects. So I'm a, I, I work in, in information security, so to us, and we are kind of entering, for me at least, entering in a territory which is just, you know, compiler and languages and so forth. So it's, it's really a new domain for us, but we want to, to bring over uh, our core principles, which is enabling, enabling trust. And we see that there are a lot of projects, you know, uh, most of Unikernel projects is something that you would never see in production. Really nice, like from a technical perspective, they're really people that they, they do something, they believe in, they have passion, and they they push the boundaries of technology, but are you going to find those in production? Well, not, not so much. So we want something that is done in a 
minimal, clean and trusted way that is good enough to be eventually accepted upstream because that's our final goal. So we wanted really to find if we can, if we can patch the regional compiler in a very minimal way. And much of the effort has been placed in that. We didn't want to pollute the Go runtime to levels which we think as security people that are unacceptable. Less is more. That was the motto of our effort. We want to have the least number of modifications, still readable, of course, that it would make sense so that we'd match the existing style structure of the way uh, the Go development team is working. Because also this leads to code which is more verifiable and it's more maintainable in the, in the future. So we design it for an hypothetical upstream inclusion in the future, so we're working for that. And we have a commitment to always sync against the latest uh, Go release. In the end, we ended up with about 3,000 lines of code of compiler changes, and that's it, in order to support runtime and uh, enable the additional Go OS architecture. Uh, we place strong emphasis on reusing code which was already there within the Go compiler framework. And the final goal is for developers to be able to use this just by having one import in their code, and that's it. If you don't need to use the hardware, you don't need to know about the hardware. Um, and we want to support unencumbered Go applications, like no limitations, ideally zero limitations uh, in the end. And also, the compiler is only half the story. We provide drivers so that you can actually run this on hardware, which uh, these days is, is, is relevant. And by using also the original Go compiler, we do inherit nice properties, such as you know, Go compiler is self-hosted, can compile itself, has reproducible builds. So these are all nice things that we do want when creating uh, our uh, firmware code. So we have three different categories of Go compiler modifications that we've done. Uh, we have what we call glue code, which is merely code that just adds the Tamago keyword to uh, a source code that needs to be compiled. So this code has no logic, it's very benign, it's just stubs and definitions where we say there's a new architecture and it's named Tamago, and so we update all of the lists which are required to enable this, uh, this support. So this is about uh, 350 uh, lines of code uh, across many files. So we change many files, but the changes are really, really tiny and really, uh, they have no impact whatsoever on the stability or security of the code. Then we have a second set of changes, which is the bulk of it, which is about 2,700 lines of code, which is reusing existing code within the Go runtime to, for execution on the bare metal. So I'll give you an example, and this is what I call the Go Frankenstein, because it was like creating a Frankenstein monster, but it's much better than what it sounds. It's not as ugly as Frankenstein, it actually works. So memory allocation, a lot of projects uh, that try to put the Go runtime on the bare metal, they completely re-implemented memory allocation and threading, and we just saw that there's the memory allocation for plan nine, which is included in Go Runtime and maintained, and with one line changed, we can use that to run on the bare metal. Because at some point, the Plan 9 memory allocator just used the uh, BRK syscall to allocate memory, but we're running on bare metal. We have our memory space, so we can just you know allocate pointers from it, and so with one line of change, we can use all of that code, which is already there, tested and maintained. For locking uh, structures and so forth, so there's a locking code within within uh, Golang, which is for the uh, WebAssembly uh, primarily, uh, and we can reuse it identically. And the nice thing about this code is that it, that it has three functions which hook into the external OS, and we're going to use those to implement proper timer support. And the nice thing is that it, we can keep a clean separation between what we need to do to run things on the bare metal and what Go already has within its code. And it's nice to do that rather than just hacking and changing uh, Go code. It's nice to have uh, nice entry points for doing things which touch the hardware uh, a little more. Uh, and then we have an in-memory file system for now, but this is going to change soon in the, in, the, in the next months because we're going to add MMC and FAT support, which is actually quite easy to do. Uh, but there's an uh, in-memory file system with NAC, which we just copy over. Uh, we, we, we enable it for Tamago and it works. And this is actually the bulk. So there's a, there's a lot of, there's the highest number of uh, line of codes changed because we, uh, because of the way the compiler works, we just need to copy the mem underscore plan 9.go file into mem underscore Tamago. Uh, in order to, to use that code. Uh, 
And then we have new code, which is about 600 lines of code in 12, fi in 12 files, which is uh, Tamago-specific functionality. And it mainly provides initialization of the uh, ARM uh, core. So this is all code which is fairly standard. You will find it in, in any OS, any bootloader, and so forth. Um, and then we have uh, code which uh, provides hooks with your application and the board package to understand how big is the memory and what's the offset of the memory and so forth. So all of the changes, like surprisingly, it was really a surprise to us that go, the Go runtime is almost freestanding on its own with not a lot of dependencies on the actual operating systems, apart from system calls that we're going to see now. So this is the extent of the modifications that we need to do uh, to run uh, Go on the bare metal, or at least to have a compiler which allows us to, to do that. This is the memory layout that, that we use. So your Go application lives there in memory. We have a heap, the stack, and uh, interrupt vector table, and so forth. So all of this is, is, is pretty standard. And we, we, we use all the available RAM depending on the board uh, that we have. So concerning Go runtime support, so basically uh, there, are, there are three components here. We have the uh, support within the Go runtime itself. So this is an example of uh, what happens in the file ostamago.arm.go. Uh, and we see that we have hooks. We have variables and functions which needs to be defined externally by the application. So we don't want to put information about all the different boards, all the different hardware. Uh, and the hardware peripherals within the Go runtime. We don't want to pollute it with that. So we, we have one generic function for hardware initialization. We have a function for printing on the console. And we have a function for getting random data and, and for getting ticks, which the runtime expects the external board package to provide. And the same goes with the uh, offset for, the, uh, for RAM, for where memory starts, what's the offset, and what's the size. And then uh, the rest of the code in, in this file is just uh, architecture-related uh, initialization, so not specific to a board, but just ARM uh, initialization and so forth. So this is, this is part of the Go compiler modifications. Then we have the uh, system on chip package, which is actually very simple, because the only thing that it provides right now is um, uh, in relation to hooks with the runtime, uh, the uh, variables where the memory starts and, and, and the offset of the stack. And then we have the board package, which actually tells what's the size of the RAM. Because the start of the memory uh, is going to be the same for the, a specific system on chip. But if you have different boards, you might have more RAM. So the actual size is specified in the board package. And so for instance, here in the USB armory uh, package, we say, OK, when I want uh, anything to be printed out on the console, the console for the USB armory is actually the second uh, UART, the second serial port. So that information belongs in the uh, USB, USB armory uh, package. Um, so this allows us to have minimal modifications in the Go runtime to have what belongs to system on chip specific information in the system on chip related package, in this case the IMX6 UL package, and any information that's specific to the board, we have it in the board support package, so in this case, uh, the USB armory. So this is the clean way uh, for doing it. Um, another example here, so here we have a timer uh, definition. So within the Go runtime, at some point, Go needs to get ticks or to understand what's the time. And that's provided externally by the IMX6 package, which provides support for the uh, generic timers uh, for the uh, for the USB armory because that's what the architecture provides, and we can also of course mix assembly when it's required. This is something that already happens in Go. It's not something that we're doing only ourselves. It's something which is common and accepted, and it's the most efficient way to deal with very low-level aspects such as getting uh, timer uh, information. So all of this is initialization code, which accounts for about 500 lines of code. So not 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 so much. And again, it follows existing patterns in the Go runtime. So this is another example. Here we are at some point, so we were developing, and we saw that the code was running slower than expected. And we were like, oh, wait a minute. We need to change the clock speed, because this system on chip by default is clocked at uh, about 400 megahertz. And if you want to run it at full speed, 900 megahertz, we actually have to do it ourselves. Like the bootloader doesn't do it. The bootloader always sets the default frequency. And so we quickly coded uh, in Go within, within our board package, uh, actually within our system on chip package, uh, the function for setting the frequency. 
policy. And this is what a driver looks like in Go. So we have our, our functions for setting uh, registers. So here we set the PLL register. Uh, we set two bits to zero at this offset. It's kind of what you, sorry, it's kind of what you would find in C, but uh, you know, just by, just by using Go. We can wait for a value uh, to, uh, to become one because we're waiting for the lock on the clock. Here we're removing the bypass that we needed for changing clock. We set a divisor and so forth. So, you know, you can write drivers uh, in Go. And the, and the interesting thing uh, about when using uh, memory safe languages on, on the bare metal is that every time you need to do something which is not safe, uh, you have a specific keyword for that. So in Go, like in other high-level languages, you have the keyword unsafe. So if you want to scout and look for all of the potentially dangerous places in the code where you're doing something which has pointer arithmetic, you can just grab for it. You can just search unsafe, and you're going to find all the occurrences on where you're using, defining, or doing pointer arithmetic. And because you do need to do that for drivers, but at least it's very easy to identify those within the code. That's also something which uh, we thought was really nice about, about, uh, about using a higher level language such as this one. Concerning syscall, so the Go runtime uh, makes direct uh, use of syscalls for a lot of functions, and this was our main concern. Do we need to emulate and, and about 50 syscall, system calls in order to have the runtime working? And it turns out that only one is actually really needed, which is uh, write, which is the one that eventually gets hooked with the uh, print k function. So now we support the write syscall only for standard output and standard error, and we use that to print uh, to the console because that's uh, the only thing that you actually need on bare metal. I mean, you're either writing on a file descriptor, which is handled in a different manner uh, within the Go runtime with the file system. Uh, but if you want to write to standard output, I mean, on these class of devices, you don't have a screen, so you have a console, and that's, and that's what we do in the board package. And if anybody wants to do something different with that in uh, the board package, which again is outside the compiler, you can define whatever print k uh, method, uh, method you want. Um, so in the end, this is what it looks like. So normally, you would have your Go runtime running under user space, under a complex OS. The Go runtime would make system calls. And then the kernel space with its drivers will be able to serve them, talk to peripherals, and so forth. With Tamago, we live in a Go runtime process. Your package is linked with the runtime. Uh, the system on chip and the board packages are also linked. And these are the ones that support the driver. And the Go runtime, every time a system call is made, uh, which in this case is the right system call, it is just hooked to the actual driver support within the Go package. But we are all within, within Go. And we use the vanilla Go runtime with the exception of a, of a few initialization and runtime support functions, which are only uh, specific to Tamago, which are the ones that are actually serving system calls and, and so forth. So this is, this is the change. And again, we're dramatically reducing not only the lines of codes count, but we are completely eliminating C, because in this setup, the only C is actually in the bootloader, which it goes away after boot. But anyway, we're also working on replacing that. But there's no C involved at all. Not a single line in all of this. So how do you develop, build, and run this thing? Well, so in order to use it, you write Go, as you always did, and you just import the board package. That's the only thing that you need to do. If you're not using the driver specifically, that's the only thing you need to do. If you want to use a driver, like random number generator or USB, then you also need to import that, as you would in Go. But to run basic operation, that's the only thing that you need. So that's the first step. Then you compile with Go build, as usual, with the exception of a few uh, flags to the linker, where we need to tell, and this depends on the board, what the entry point is going to be, uh, and uh, where are we going to have the, the text of our uh, the, the text segment of our application. But that's it. So we have Go as Tamago, Go Arm 7, Go Arch Arm, and then we just you use Go build. So Tamago here is a variable where we have just the Go, the Go runtime compiled with Tamago support. And then this is uh, uBoot, bootloader. You just load the resulting ELF. That's it. There's no intermediate bootloader needed. It just, you would just run this application as you would uh, a kernel. Um, so 
we implemented drivers, security-oriented drivers for our system on chip to prove ourselves that this can actually be used. Uh, and this was a, an important part of the process. So the IMAX 6 ULL, which we use on the USB armory, has a few uh, security drivers that we needed to enable. So the first one that we developed was for the data coprocessor, which is the element that allows you to do encryption and decryption and key derivation with a hardware unique key, which is fused at the first uh, power up of the system on chip within the chip. It's fused, you cannot read it, you can only use it, and it's unique uh, for each chip. So we wrote a driver for that. The driver takes about 240 lines of code, which is, uh, I think, 10 times less than the Linux kernel module uh, for this. And then if you load its package, you can just invoke the arrive key, and you can derive a key uh, using, using the hardware. It also detects if you're secure booted or, or not. And also note, the nice thing is that we can use structures that we create in Go, so they can be made C compatible with a little effort, so you can use them to and pass them to the actual hardware, to the memory, so that data can be allocated. So we, we just, we just uh, allocate a structure here, and then we actually pass a pointer to things, to the structure, and it just, it just works. Here at the bottom here, we're actually writing the address of our Go allocated structure to uh, register, to the hardware register, and then the hardware will going to fetch the structure and do and do its work. Uh, we wrote the driver for the random number generator. There's a true random number generator within uh, uh, within the system on chip, which can be used. is useful for the very first boot when you because uh, this kind of hardware doesn't have a battery. There's no real time clock, so the very first boot um, you don't have any. Uh, you need an initial seed, and this is this is a good use for that. And so we also wrote 150 lines uh, a driver. Uh, for this, and we hooked it to the crypto run function of Go. So you just use Go normally, and the random number generators, if you use crypto run, they're going to come from this. Then I wrote a USB driver, which it's something that makes you question your life choices, I tell you, where you're at that point in your life that you're writing, uh, almost 40 years old, and you're writing a USB driver. However, my only concern was reading and studying reference manual. At least it wasn't dealing with. Uh, with C and and memory and so forth. So actually, Go really helped me keeping keeping me happy because I could use Go routines, I could use channel, I could use mutexes whenever I wanted. So it was a delight. My only problem was actually understanding uh, the reference manual. And when developing drivers with Go, there's only uh, two aspects that you need to care about, which are unusual for Go programmers because they never have to deal with that. Um, uh, you need aligned structures in memory because uh, most hardware will refuse to load data from an, an aligned pointer. So we created a class for that. Uh, and to keep the garbage collector happy, uh, you need to carry around the underlying buffer, which allows us to do the, the buffer alignment. But again, that's the only concern that you really need uh, to uh, take care about. And so we have a full driver. Uh, we also, uh, for every driver that we do, every every time we touch the hardware, we put the page number and the name and the section of the reference manual. Because trust me on that, by looking at code from the Linux kernel and other projects, there were so many quirks that if there would have been just one comment to the right page, you could have save yourself hours of just learning. So if you want to learn about system on chip and driver development, uh, we also put all of the references that you need in order to understand what's going on. And I think that's something that's missing a lot into, into kernel modules these days. USB networking. So once I had the USB driver, we implemented USB networking in two hours. Uh, that was easy. So uh, half of the code is just uh, defining the descriptors. And then we define two functions for transmitting and receiving um, Ethernet over USB packets. And we have the two functions. And we hook them to Google NetStack, which is a very nice uh, full Go TCP IP stack made by Google. And so we just, we just pull that in. And now I'm going to show you the demo of all of this, if the demo gods have been kind to me. So on the left side, I'm going to boot um, my USB armory with Tamago. So this is Tamago running. So what it did in, in, in these few seconds, uh, the bootloader booted directly into, into Go. Self-test of the random number generator. We change the clock speed. We say hello because we're polite. We launch seven Go routines. We derive the key. We read a file in memory. We slept 400 milliseconds just to make sure that that timer implementation is correct. We, uh, we generated a few random numbers. We made a few ACDACA signatures. We signed a Bitcoin transaction. 
the Go routine completed, then we allocated about 1.5 uh, giga gigabytes of memory just because to check that garbage collection works. And now we are waiting for USB. So if I plug it in into my other USB armory, I have a USB armory connected to the USB armory. It's very meta. So now the USB descriptor has been, has been evaluated, and now we already see network traffic. So if I connect to my USB armory now, So hello, this is a simple UDP echo server. I can ask for a random number. I can debug the memory, and I can also do this. I can stream Star Wars in ASCII. <laughs> and if it's not as smooth as you think it should be, the problem is not the armory. It's actually Windows, which doesn't support a uh, console very well. So, so, so yeah, all of this, except for the boot part, except for the bootloader, all of you are seeing here, USB, TCP IP handling, streaming, everything, there's not a single line of C code involved. It is pure Go and little assembly. And I think that this is, uh, I think this is pretty cool. I don't know what you think, but yeah. So performance. Uh, We'll see if the movie ends while we go. So performance, as expected, the speed is the same uh, compared to running the same Go application under Linux. So this is an example of ECDSA signatures from the Go compiler test suite running under Linux on the same hardware and running under Tamago. And the times are actually identical because, you know, and, and this, is, this is what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be either identical or even faster because we have less overhead from the operating system uh, doing content switching. There are a few limitations. There are very few, and we're working on them. So first of all, on this hardware, we're single-threaded. Uh, so uh, if you have a tight loop and you have functions in this tight loop which don't uh, go back to the runtime, uh, it's going to be stuck forever there. Uh, this is not unique to us. This is what Go does every time you have a max prox one uh, and you're single-threaded. So this is, this is expected and normal. And you can also avoid it, by the way. You can, you can force invocation to the scheduler in tight loops. But usually, if you have really tight loops that don't do anything, it's just because you're testing uh, Tamago, not because you're actually doing real work. Uh, we have to implement uh, file system uh, storage, uh, so file system support and storage. So we're gonna we're gonna do that. If you import a package that needs something which requires an OS, such as terminal console and so forth, it's not gonna work, uh, but that's expected. You can link if you want C code, but why would you after my talk, right? But you can if you want, as long as it's freestanding. There's no OS, there's no users, there's no signals, there's no environment variables. This is a feature, not a bug. Um, so with the expression of the few surprises, again, Go is surprisingly adept to run on bare metal. And now we're going to use this in the future to write the secure firmware that we want. We want to write HSMs, cryptocurrency wallet, authentication tokens, trust and secure monitors, and much more. Uh, this is the baseline for developing secure applications on this kind of hardware. So again, we learned that we can reduce complexity, not just shift it around. We kill C completely, at least in this very specific implementation. And again, it's all about enabling the choice of a language which didn't have much chance of the bare metal, but now we think it does. And we just want to, in the next months, to build trust with this and maybe have it accepted upstream. So thanks to all these people that enable us to do this project. And now I have two minutes for questions, I hope. Just one couple of questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Andrea. Perfect ending time, 13.37. So we still have 13 minutes for Q&A. So uh, if you want to ask questions, we have three microphones. Please line up here. Microphone three is actually equipped with an induction loop if you're using hearing aids. And I get a signal. We have questions from the signal angel in the very back from the internet. Hello. Uh, I have two questions from the internet, from the IRC. Uh, the first one is, does the garbage collector somehow cause performance issues on bare metal? No, not in our experience. Um, and also, when working on the bare metal, if you really want, you can also turn it off. I mean, that's something that Go always had. You can turn off the garbage collection if you want, and you can run it either at very specific times, or if your application is short-lived, and as predictable memory allocation, you can also decide not to run it 
at all. It really depends on what you're doing. In our experience for the operations that we need to do, we never stumble into problems. And its performance and behavior is pretty much the same that you would see on normal Go application running under normal OS. There's actually no difference. We're not changing its behavior. OK, thank you. The next, quest, uh, the next question and the last question is, um, is Tamago suitable for real-time applications? And if so, how much? I think that by disabling the garbage collection, possibly it can. Um, I'm not a big fan of real-time operating systems. In our work experience, every time somebody uses a real-time operating system, they had so many bugs anyway that the real-time part wasn't really working really well, and actually they really didn't need it. But of course, there are some application, financial applications where you really need it. Um, if you have the time and effort for that, Rust is probably a much better suited language for that. Uh, having said that, I think there might be a chance that by turning the garbage collection off, uh, this can also be worried, because in the end, the, the, the result is very predictable if you turn garbage collection off. Next question from microphone number one, please. Thanks for your, uh, thanks for your project. Three small questions. First, uh, do you usually look at the assembly which uh, you have after compiling uh, on your platform? Second, uh, Go is very famous for fuzzing. Do you have some fuzzing of your applications on your platform? And the last one, um, did you find any uh, bugs in Go runtime while porting on new platform? So, yes, we look at the assembly. Uh, we also use the Go assembler ourselves. Uh, the generation is identical, again, to what you have with normal Go on x86, or, or sorry, with ARM. Uh, the difference is that it runs on the bare metal, So, but the efficiency that you're going to get when compiling is the same, because we're not touching that. We're not touching the Go assembler. We just use it. Um, the second question... Uh, fuzzing. Fuzzing. So we want to use this to fuzz USB, actually. One of our projects is to implement a low-level USB fuzzer with the USB armory that can fuzz the host. Um, we're also trying to understand how we can integrate fuzzing of this externally with Go uh, by using Go Fuzz. But yes, it's something that we're thinking of. Um, and the third one... Did you find any bugs in yes. runtime itself? Yes. In fact, if you look... When you get the slides, just just look at this slide. There's a fun Go bug in the in the top right in the bottom right corner about the garbage collection. So yeah, we found at least one. It's it's a it's a weird property, but yeah, we found one. But we have uh, we're working with the people uh, that that work on the Go compiler for a living, and they're being so supportive. So so yeah, but it, it's not a stopper. Not a, we didn't find anything that was a showstopper for us. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. We have another question from the internet via our signal angel. Yes, uh, there, are, there are three more questions. Oof. I think we have time for that. One, OK. Uh, then we take. Well, you, you get all three, but just one now. Pick the then. easiest one. OK. <laughs> How suitable would Tamago be for writing code for other microcontrollers, for example, 32U4? So for microcontrollers, just go with TinyGo. Because okay. the footprint okay. of applications built with the standard Go compiler is pretty large. So TinyGo, which is a great project, is a very good reason to exist. So for microcontrollers, TinyGo, system on chips, Tamago. That's separation. Next question, microphone three, please. Hello. Um, thank you very much for the talk and for the work. Um, so uh, will you be supporting other targets um, as well, like the Armory MK1 and uh, all winner chips? Yes. So we plan to support the Armory Make 1, Mark 1, and we also plan to support the Raspberry Pi Zero. We're actually working on that right now, because, of course, we don't want to just support our hardware. We think it's important to, to give the chance to other projects of this. And it's actually very easy to support other pieces of hardware. Uh, it, it's only a few days of work. So yes, definitely. And pull requests are welcome. OK, back to the signal angel. All right. Uh, another question is, um, oh, I got it. Uh, can this be run on other Cortex R class processors, or is it the same? Use TinyGo. Um, it can be it can be executed uh, on any uh, system on chip that has uh, ARM architecture support within the Go runtime. So I would say that it would be trivial to run it on any ARM uh, V7 uh, system on chip. 
and it should be very easily adaptable to, to other ones. Again, the number of modifications required and the hardware initialization make it so that it's easy to port it to other platforms. Uh, so as long as we're talking about system on chips with Cortex, uh, it should be fairly easy to do. Yeah, uh, thank you for the question, uh, for the answer. <laughs> uh, I have more questions. Uh, what would Tamago also run on the USB Armory MK1? Yes, yes, definitely. So we're gonna we're gonna make sure that we provide that support uh, soon enough. Okay. A very Could interested C only developer asked on Twitter, "What is about debugging breakpoints, register maps, and register manu manipulation?" on the MCU using Tamago? Uh, GDB works beautifully. So we use GDB, we use breakpoints, we can stop anywhere we want, we see the code, just like any other application. Otherwise, we would have gone insane. So yes, that works. OK, next up, microphone number two, please. Um, you mentioned file system support. Um, yes. Are you using, I think you mentioned FAT. Do you use the, um, there is a pure Go implementation for this, um, sorry. No, I'm blanking the name. Uh, the, the Fuchsia project, I think, has a full FAT implementation. Can you I speak go. up a bit, please? Oh, yeah. The, the Fuchsia implementation, mm -hmm. I think they're using a, a user-space driver for FAT. Right. That's all in Go. Is that yeah, what they, they use? Uh, FAT, uh, pure Go FAT implementation, they're already out. Uh, there's something, the, the GERD project already has that and also has the MMC support. So we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna try and, and get that and, and put it in. It should, be, it should be very trivial effort. And I just mentioned on FAT because it's an easy file system format and usually on a better system you just want to take a blob, write it, read it. You don't need fancy storage. Thanks. Microphone number one, please. Thanks for the talk. Um, have you talked to Upstream about getting it into the main line? Yes, uh, we're working on that. Uh, we're very anxious about it because we want everything to be super clean. Uh, but uh, uh, it is our intention to give this the best possible chance. And we have contacts uh, upstream. And this was coded from the very beginning with the intention to make things clean, nice, respectful on what's already there in the goal run team. We didn't want to hijack things that, that are not meant to be hijacked. And that's our goal. Because in the end, I don't want to maintain the compiler part. I just want to maintain the drivers and everything else. So yeah, we're really trying hard to make this in a, in a state where it has the best chance to be accepted upstream. Do you have a timeline? Uh, no. no. But I would hope uh, by the end of next year. Would it be still called Tamago? And why is it called Tamago? Uh, so it probably won't be called Tamago. Uh, it is called Tamago because Tamago means egg in Japanese, and you have Go, and Go lives on bare metal in its own shell, and so it's Tamago. And if you run it under QEMU, it's a Tamagotchi. Ah. <laughs> Thank you. This is the only reason why we do these projects. We first come up with a name, and they were like, oh, what can I do with that name? Yeah. Do we have any more questions from the internet? No, we do not. Um, I think we have another question at microphone number one. Um, how, how is it today's embedded system often have some screens? Mm -hmm. Well, um, the USB armory has no screen, so it wasn't our focus right now. Having said that, there's no reason why you couldn't implement a video driver with this. Uh, maybe it won't be as performant as it can, but if you're doing DMA right and you're clever enough, of course it can work. But for now, it's not, it's not our focus. Our focus now is having smarter smart cards, HSMs, tokens, authentication tokens. So we have Bluetooth on the USB armory. Uh, we have USB. For, for now, if we really want a UI with the USB armory, we either have a mobile app or you do it through networking. But yes, maybe in the future. Who knows? Are there any more questions? I guess not. Well then, thank you a thank lot, Thank you Andrea. so much. Thank you.